Hello and welcome to Bud's RPG Review, where I give my thoughts on role-playing games, card games and board games. Today's retro review is 1994's Strangers in Prax, RuneQuest 3rd Edition by Chaosium. Ok, first a bit of history. Strangers in Prax is a 96-page softback book of scenarios and adventure seeds for use in and around the Zolafell Valley. The scenarios are set around three powerful visitors and the schemes they become embroiled in. The Lunar Coders, Baron the Monster Killer and Arlerton the Magus. It was also one of the last supplements produced for 3rd edition. OK, to the cover. Here, we have an OK piece by Stephen Langmead showing the arrival of the Lunar Coders. OK, to the inside. There will be spoilers from this point on, so stop watching now if you intend to play this. As we open the book, we are greeted with the inscription, Beware! This book and its history are part of the restricted collection, not for the casual use of the uninitiated. Seek the permission of the special librarian before reading this tome. As with all of the RuneQuest books, I love these inscriptions as they really set the tone for what follows. First up is a section with the heading Welcome Stranger, which details the idea behind the supplement. We're provided with three sets of characters that are powerful foreign visitors to the River of Cradles. These are a group of five masterful lunar agents called the Coders, who act with the authority of the Red Emperor, Baron the Monster Killer, a servant of Magasta, the King of the Seas, who destroys great monsters of the deep to gain his lord's favour, and Arlerton the Magus, a wizard and his apprentice who have come to set up shop in Pavis, despite the ingrained superstitions of the locals. Each of these can act as patrons, foes, or provide adventure hooks for groups of varying power levels. It makes the point that these are supposed to be models of high-powered characters, and that Arlerton is the first fully developed Garanthan sorcerer in print. Next we have the first group, the Lunar Coders. The Coders are agents of the Lunar Empire, who are dispatched by the Emperor personally on political missions. They directly serve the provincial governor, Appius Luxius, who is himself rumoured to be one of the Red Emperor's sons. The Coders exist to carry out the Emperor's will, to defy them is to defy the Red Emperor by proxy. The Coders are described as the model of decency and civilised behaviour. They are non-chaotics and always work in the open, identifiable by their distinctive red cloaks. They consist of their leader, Count Julian, a sword of Yanifal Tarnils, and a man of aristocratic bearing, Princess Anderida of Raybanth, a member of the highest lunar nobility who turned her back on a life of privilege to save the Emperor, who is a priestess of the Seven Mothers and noticeable for her bald head. Nose Ring, a highly skilled swordsman and former initiate of Dan Five Zaron, who has an allied spirit as a reward for his services. Eslas the Tracker, a red-headed pent-outcast, lunar convert, tracker and archer, and Maculus the Monitor, an initiate of the Red Goddess and Ripiontor, who has considerable sorceress powers and is an Isolor Luminate. All of them have, in some way, experienced the grim side of lunar society, which has given them an understanding of each other and people that they meet who have had similar experiences. It gives some information on their past history, as well as the code they live by. Their current mission involves a reoccurring, seemingly prophetic dream that Appius Luxius is having that involves Pavus, the Red Moon, and a cloud shaped like a dragon. We have notes on how the coders communicate, and then it launches into how a DM is best advised to introduce them into a campaign. They first appear as a faint reddish glow on the horizon near Dragon Pass and slowly grow into a moonbeam carrying a flying boat. We were provided with a detailed description of them and then give some information on their first few days and the effect that their arrival has upon the city. It moves quickly onto the adventure hooks involving the coders, one of which is the incredibly dangerous Chaos Gaggle, where the players should witness their prowess and it also gives a few seeds where they are actually pursuing the players. It then gives a fairly detailed scenario which involves the coders in a variety of adversarial roles that has the ordaining of a new high priest of Orlanth at the new Pavisir temple and then a pursuit into the rubble where the players can encounter the coders riding on wyverns. This can be played out many ways although they will find the coders fair and precise the whole way. Following this it goes into meticulous detail on the coders themselves giving us some decent portraits and artwork although Nose Ring seems to actually be missing the ring from his nose in his art. Next up is Baron the Monster Killer. Before we are introduced to Baron, we are given a brief synopsis of the closing and the voyages of Dormal and his magic that reopened the seas, as well as some information on the lives of those that choose the sea as their mistress. We have an interesting piece on the horizon on Garantha. This is important as Garantha has no curvature due to it being flat and lozenge shaped. Here, the distance seen across flat plains, like the sea, is limited by how far your eyes can see. The far distance would be a haze. It also discusses how useful crow's nests are in Garantha. It then moves on to Baron. He is a holy man whose entire life is devoted to Magasta. He considers that he honours Magasta by slaying the mighty creatures that he creates. His reasoning is that he is proving that he is mightier than them and thus makes Magasta proud. He has slain over a dozen mighty sea monsters such as the Star Crab, the Embracer, the Underdecker, the Bronze Fish, the Geezer, Kagman, the Suckered One, the Ocular Princess and the Maiden Taker. Although these creatures are monstrous, they are not chaotic, a point which Baron is keen to stress. He is considered strange even to other sailors. He's missing his left eye which has been replaced by an ivory globe that grants him several magical powers and his face is terribly scarred. He is broad, muscled and grizzled with short brown hair that sticks out at irregular angles and has a patchy, bushy beard. 
It then details his fellow crewmen, including Amor Anzed, a priest of Dormal, Milnim Sharkblood, a Ludoc Merman, and Tazo the shipbuilder from the Eastern Isles. These are all valuable to Baron. It then gives you a simple map of his ship, the Cherna, and then goes on to provide you with some adventure hooks. The first involves Baron becoming a distant patron of the adventurers in order to get information on the famed weapon at Harpoon, as Tazo has advised Baron that he could build a ship capable of withstanding the strain of launching 12-yard harpoons from its deck, should he be able to get a look at it. Baron is paying well, and there are many approaches as to how this can be done. The next involves obtaining one of the 12 ever-burning torches, items created before time began when Zaraxaran stole fire from Yelmalio. Hundreds of years ago, Cragspider took this divine blood and created 13 lead rods that came to be known as the Torches of Everburning, or Torches of Blood by Yelmalians, who have managed to capture and destroy five of them. Baron needs these torches to slay a sea monster called the Vomiter. Again, Baron is paying well to obtain these, although the risk is commensurate as they are currently the property of Kruzigog, a great troll deathlord of Zaraxaran. They serve as a symbol of power to Kruzigog, but there are various methods of getting the torches such as stealth, bribery and other trolls. Using force would probably be suicidal. The third seed involves the adventurers journeying to the Desolation Hills to obtain wood from the Giant Boot Tree, so named as giants make war boots from the wood and it is renowned for its strength. Baron wants a large supply of the wood in order for Tazo to make a small ship, or at least a support for a ship made of normal wood. The adventure involves not only the players obtaining the wood, but the subsequent floating of the wood down the river of cradles by raft and all of the various dangers and encounters that can happen. The final part is a scenario involving Baron called Search for the Sea Princess. Here, he accompanies the adventurers to Corflu in order to search for an alluring sea princess with pale skin, green hair and a voice like songbirds and persuade her to come to his ship. Baron's real purpose here is to lure the vomiter to Corflu. The next part is called Belly of the Eel. The adventurers are in Corflu, and over the next few days the vomiter makes its presence known in the spirit plane with manifestations of ghostly pirates, fish seemingly swimming in the air and water becoming salty. It should all accumulate on the first day of sacred time when the vomiter arrives. Watchdog, the protector of Corflu, goes out to confront the vomiter but is flung through the air and buried in silt and sand under five metres of water. The vomiter itself is a giant eel that weighs over three million tonnes. It's 50 metres thick and two kilometres long. It is a monster of monsters that swallows sea creatures that fight it out in its enormous series of stomachs and is eventually vomited out as a monster itself. Baron intends to enter into the vomiter voluntarily and use the previously acquired torches of everburning to cut through to its heart and kill it. He believes that this will then transport him to the hero plane where he can begin hero questing. Lots of preparation needs to be done for the attack, but the adventure should ultimately culminate in Baron, the adventurers and his crew entering the vomiter and fighting their way through the various monstrosities who are fighting for their lives until they reach the fourth stomach where Baron will cut through until he reaches the creature's heart and burns it with the torches. This will cause the vomiter to die, releasing its stomach content into the sea, and which could cause a problem for the adventurers. Baron, as he predicted, vanishes off to the hero plane. There are various options presented as to what the players could do next, and this is followed by the stats for Baron and his crew. Last, but definitely not least, is Arlerton the Magus. Due to Arlerton being a very competent sorcerer, it is advised that you study this section before running him. Arlerton arrives in Pavis before the Emperor replaces Saur Eel in Storm Season of 1621. The players encounter him and his apprentice at the Old Gate, where they can gain employment by him. It is stressed that Arlatan is not what the locals would consider an evil sorcerer. He hates chaos and all non-humans, and wears an amulet of law and follows the Rakari sect of Malkianism. It does give us notes on portraying Arlatan as an evil sorcerer, but stresses against cheapening him by using him melodramatically. It then goes on to talk about Arlatan and Prax, and details how he ended up in Pavis. He does have some restrictions on him due to his religious responsibilities, such as never accepting non-sorcerous spells cast on him, or the use of spirits possessing divine or spirit magic. As a Rakari, he also loathes the spell tapping, as it is forbidden, although he does have an open-mindedness and flexibility about him. It then talks about his relationship with his apprentice, Mikos, and his relations with women. Due to his upbringing, he is devoutly chauvinistic, and considers women to be either nuns, wives, or maybe healers or crafters. He will ignore them and will not hire them. After this, we have some information on the general attitude to sorcerers from the barbarians to the lunars, and their opinions vary from wanting to burn the witch to acceptance. It points out the difference that Malchioni have in the use of the words wizard and sorcerer. Wizards have an almost religious function, upholding the law of Malchion, whereas sorcerers practice the art without control or influence. It discusses Arlerton's distaste for non-humans and his appearance. Arlerton is tall and slim, with very pale skin, with no visible scars, and all of his own teeth. He looks very different to the people of Pavis, and seems to be freakishly clean. In combat, Arlerton will always flee if possible, and will only use lethal force under the right circumstances. He is, however, utterly ruthless with captives, unless there is a ransom, or they are Malchioni. It then goes on to discuss Arlerton's familiar nail head, which he treats the same way that we would treat an expensive car. It has a solid bronze body that it can warp and manipulate into virtually any shape. It has an intelligence and a personality that has a keen, slightly malicious sense of humour, which Arlerton tries to discourage. 
His apprentice, Mikos, is a young man that bears little hostility towards strangers and who loves to talk. He acts as Arlerton's spokesman for the larger part. He's very interested in fashion, with long pointed shoes and bright coloured tight hose being his forte. He's very devoted to his master, although he doesn't share his drive to greatness. It then gives some discussion on how to use Arlerton in your campaign. The first part of this is called The Riot, or Guess Who's Coming to Pavis. This is where Arlerton is introduced to the players, which discusses his entry into the city and how he scatters a mob forming around him. We even have the in-game details of how he does this. This then moves on to how Arlerton makes a base in the city and how the players slowly gain his trust. Following that, we have a section called Jealous Scholars. This talks about how the Lankwar Michaels in Pavis slowly begins to hate him for the services that he provides, as his mystic vision spell can last a full half day, and he has no cult restrictions preventing him from working when he wants to. Ultimately, a delegation of sages will try to reach an accord with him which will fail. This could lead to targeted attacks on him. He also offers his services as a wand for hire at the rate of 200 wheels per day. It gives details on his search for a home, and he ultimately turns his attention to the arm of Pavis, a tower in the rubble currently occupied by bandits. Arlton devises a plan to take the tower where the players get to see his sorceress prowess. It begins with the adventurers allowing a cart of wine caskets that they are transporting through the rubble to be hijacked by the bandits, with the idea to get them drunk and attack them while they're recovering. It details the armour pavis itself and its contents and gives details on the plan of attack, the resistance that will be faced and all of the bandit leaders. Each has their own motivations and distinct personalities. It then moves on to staging the battle and Arlerton's plans for the armour pavis's restoration. The second part of the scenario, Black Magic, involves a series of assaults by the neighbouring Afengeng troll clan. Their queen, Aziok, has kept her sorceress prowess a secret from humans and sees Arlerton as a threat to this. She decides to take matters into her own hands. The attacks are launched via a week-long ritual called the Web of Seven Deaths that unleashes something upon Arlerton each night. The first night she sends shades against him, followed by the Beast of Lead, a rain of poisonous spiders is next, a Black Fang Assassin, and then attacks by NPCs brought in by Aziok. This is followed by an assault by Zarak Zarani, and then, finally, the Queen herself, who is greatly enhanced with many spells, so much so that she looks like a huge armoured troll with spider legs. There are various conditions for victory depending on how the threats of the previous days have been dealt with, and the final battle is detailed. Should the adventurers succeed and Arlton survive, they find an employer and ally for life. Lastly, we have some errata and protective circle, and the stats for everything in this section of the book. Strangers and Prax was a book I really enjoyed. Each group is meticulously described and statted out, and the adventure hooks are interesting, really well written, and generally succeed in developing the plot around the actions of the players. There were times, however, that I struggled, as the book refers quite a lot to the River of Cradles supplement, and it occasionally has a density that only someone who has deep insight into the world of Grantha and the at times fairly heavy hitting mechanics of the RuneQuest system would fully appreciate. Each group has their own baggage and motivations, and the choice of the type of people that are normally shunned by outsiders a group of lunar agents, a crazy monster-hunting sailor, and a Malkaoni wizard, was clearly by design in order to put players out of their comfort zone, something that I feel it succeeds in doing, as generally the outsiders don't want to harm them. The production values are fairly nice throughout, and the art is pretty good, if a bit sparse, plus the stats for anything important are fully contained. It's not really a book for beginners, as it does bludgeon you with information in places, but for those that are up to speed on all things Garantha, it's a veritable wealth of interesting people, places and situations. I give Strangers in Prax an 8 out of 10. If you enjoyed this review, make sure to hit the thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, and also check out my other reviews. Lastly, if you enjoy what I produce here, then maybe think about supporting me on Patreon. But out.